Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. I am your host today, TJ Van Toll, and we have a special panelist episode for you today, which means I am joined also by my co-host Paige Niedringhaus. Hey everybody. And Jack Harrington. Hello. All right, so we, we have a fun sort of topic for you today. We're just gonna do a grab bag of React news. So Woo! one thing that we don't get to do so often when we have guests on every week is those episodes tend to be tailored to a specific topic. And turns out a lot has been going on in the React world. It's you been- You say. Yeah, it's <laughs> been kind of a busy handful of months. So uh, we're a just gonna bit. go through, I've got like five or six different things, topics that we wanna discuss. We'll just go through them one by one, uh, toss them out there for discussion and see what we all think. So number one on my list is create React app. So create React app has kind of been a staple of the React world for a long time. I think mm -hmm. I was looking- Oh, since the beginning. 2016. Looking at this, yeah, yeah, 2016, so seven years oh, that's of all? this tool. It seems like it should be 10, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think like for most people, I mean, it was designed to be the place you start if you're doing React, or at least for most people. Uh, so I think most of our listeners will have experience with it, but it's kind of languished, right? For the last few years, the, debatably, but there's been a lot of tooling, a lot of tooling advances that haven't necessarily made it into Create React app and people are kind of wondering its future. So then recently, like very recently, within the last week or two of recording this, the React team has kind of put out some information about the future plans of the tool. Yeah, I know you two are a little bit more aware of that than me. So why don't you want to just uh, walk through what the plan is moving forward? Yeah, Theo dropped a bomb in the, the comments, uh, in the comments or issues of Create React App saying, why does this even exist? And <laughs> Dan was Dan Dan gave like a a five page soliloquy about it. Um, Paige, you want, you want to summarize? Sure. I mean, like we said, Create React App came out in 2016 and it really was kind of a game changer for web development and React, building React applications. It took away all the thinking about Webpack configs. It took away all the wiring up. It basically just gave you an out of the box, here is a working page. Here are some components to get you going. You don't have to worry about deployments. It's It minifies, it bundles, it transpiles, it does all that great stuff. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was great. It was great for the time. It was uh, fantastic for teams just getting started and learning React. But it hasn't, and, and this is a really tough thing, it hasn't been able to keep pace with what has been happening. It never supported server-side rendering. So if you wanted that, you had to somehow build it yourself. So it wasn't great for big sites that depended on SEO, for e-commerce, um, really anything that had to do with server-side. And it just has continued to not get as much love and attention as bigger frameworks that have come along, like Next.js, like Gatsby, like Remix. Um, or V, just because, if you want to use... Heavy, or V. Heavy. Yeah, if you, if you really only care about the client side stuff, V yeah. is smaller and cleaner and faster and all of that. Yeah. So if you wanted to switch out Webpack for V, if you wanted to use some other compiler, basically it it was something that you had to kind of custom roll yourself. You had to add it in. You had to maintain it. You had to figure out how to eject, create React app Ugh. and stay up to date. It It, it has been not... <laughs> you know, there have been a lot of other new options that have come along that are better. So, you know, if you want to read, the, we'll link to the entire summary that Dan gives talking about the architecture, the evolution, how the community has evolved. But basically, it comes down to we need to either create a brand new version of Create React app, a brand new start from scratch framework. Uh, we need to deprecate the old version so that people stop using it and putting it into production, which I am definitely guilty of myself. I have worked on teams where that has become the production application. Um, we need to make Create React App some kind of a, a single use framework, um, kind of, you know, put more effort back into it or like they said, turn it into a launcher. So it is a good starter. It's a classic, but 
it's not something that you would necessarily want to put into production today. Use it as kind of a playground, learn the basics, and then pick a framework that takes it a step further and put that into production instead. And that's I, I didn't I didn't read it that way. Actually, I, I read it as I was thinking more like a view CLI where I like. It kind of gives you it, it does give you that prompt of like, hey, here are your options. You could use Next.js, you could use V. And it doesn't do any mm. of it. It's just all it is is just like a a thing. But that was what I got from it. But a nice little UI on top of picking a framework. Because they they really don't want to be in the framework business. And I think that that's what Dan was like. No, that's not us. You know. And I think that's a good call, because they're not. They don't want to be. They don't want to do that. It is. I mean, everybody has all the big frameworks that we just talked about have jumped on top of them and made it their own and made it really useful and easy and, you know, good. So as the underlying secret sauce, I would agree with them that I wouldn't want to be the framework itself. I would just want to be the stuff that powers it all. <laughs> yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because we're still reading into a little bit, right? Like none of this has actually happened <laughs> yeah, yet. Exactly. This is like the React team laying out their plans. But uh, from previous experience, when the React team lays out their plans, it could be a few months, it could be a few years before these plans come to fruition. Mm -hmm. I, I do think it's interesting because Create React App is the one of these approaches that took off substantially. Like it's it really has been a cornerstone of React development. And I'm curious that if, if it does turn into just a launcher of some variety, what that is going to mean, like when people learn React, what are, because create React app, potentially not great for production, but amazing for beginners, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the, what the one-to-one -one replacement for that even is. Well, imagine if they did the launcher thing, like the top item would be like Vite, you know, hey, you could make a Vite app, you know, and then yeah. that, that, Click on that, and then it's effectively the same thing. You know, it, it's got all of the the basics built into it, um, and it's just faster, which is nice. And it's maintained by a team. And actually, I, I think this has a decent chance of like turning around really fast because this has been like a gaping wound in the side of React for a long time. <laughs> and this would basically just be, hey, we're just going to come out with this thing. You can make plugins to advertise your own, you know, framework du jour. Right. And there you go. Bob's your uncle and we're done. We're out. Peace out. Like we're not now we can just be the view for the view framework react library and not have to deal with this thing. And people giving us crap about it all the time. But yeah, I imagine this, some of this is their team. Like that has to be an absolutely awful project to maintain. Right. Just the, <laughs> the, the random issues and PRs and like, just I feel sorry for the person that has to just monitor PRs coming in and issues coming into that repo because it's just got to be out of control and doing that for seven years. And I think they're ready That's to just wash time. their hands a yeah. little bit of all of that. <laughs> Welcome to Meta. Here's your job. <laughs> Take over. <laughs> it is right funny, now. though, when you talk about the React team making announcements or sweeping proclamations and then taking years to actually get them into production. I mean, the React documents beta have been in beta version for two, three years now. Eventually, we're just going to have to pull the plug on the first set of docs and <laughs> switch over. <laughs> I want the docs just at least just get rid of class components in the docs. That's all I care about. Like, uh, but people can't like, hey, class components are still for reals because they, they're in the docs. Like, no, they're, no, they're not. Dude, seriously, please yeah. don't. Well, fun. Uh, so that is our first piece of big news. And after that, there's been a slew of new versions of just about everything. <laughs> um, I, I've got a, a long list of them. I guess the first I've got on my list is TypeScript 5, which is now available as a beta. Uh, pro perhaps by the time you're listening to this, it might be out. I don't know about the TypeScript team's release cadence, but it seems to be more regular than React, <laughs> at least. <laughs> so I imagine it's not too far off. Uh, there are a bunch of things that are new in here. I'm looking at a full list. Um, so we're going to go through the syntax of each and every command. <laughs> in depth, every, <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> every flag. See, um, we'll be here for a week. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, that, so the headlining feature of this is decorators which is something that's been in uh, TypeScript for a long time as an experimental feature. 
And they're adding it now. It's an upcoming ECMAScript feature. So it's getting sort of standardized in the spec. And as such, TypeScript is putting their um, sort of uh, uh, their version of it that conforms to the spec. What's the word I'm looking for when they make a feature available before uh, before it's available in the browser so it compiles down? Oh, like oh transpile. transpile. Transpile, yeah. Transpile. Yeah. They're like, they're making it available for everybody right yeah. now, transpiling it in a way that works for everybody. So I'm curious, have either of you used decorators before in, in your code? I have not. Um, I have used decorators in other languages. So Java, if you Java, used Spring yeah. Boot mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. is very, very big on decorators. And it makes Java a whole lot easier, I will say. But I really haven't felt like I've missed anything in JavaScript or in TypeScript up till this point. So if anybody can enlighten me as to the benefits of decorators, I'd love to, I'd love to learn more about them. <laughs> I've used decorators in things like Next, Nest JS, so that's the API framework, mm -hmm. and it's very heavily influenced by Java. Like, wow, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a lot of classes, a lot of OO, a lot of very kind of interfaces to factories to blah to blah to blah kind of thing, and it uses decorators extensively and things and it, it's, it's cool like for things like oh i need the, i need an authorization check on this particular route you know mm -hmm. at authorized you know bang you're done like boom doesn't get much easier than that which is nice but i gotta tell you like ah uh, i really don't want to get into aop or aspect oriented programming world with javascript it was nice to leave that behind leave that <laughs> You know, Java can do its own thing. We're JavaScript. We're a different thing. We're the script. We're lightweight. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to do that stuff. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with both of you because I've done them both in my Java days and then my Angular days. Oh, and I don't look right. Back, I don't look oh, back yeah. fondly on either of those experiences, to be totally <laughs> honest with you. I, so for anybody that is, if you're completely lost about this, decorators are essentially a little, you put at whatever above a function i think i think you can use them with classes as well it's definitely, it's definitely classes i don't know about the function i think maybe function definitely class methods and classes okay you could definitely use it on uh functions within um like uh, members of a class yes i'm looking right. at an example yeah. on here as well so you put like above a class like at like i don't know logging enabled or at authorized <laughs> or and there's some mechanism to like plug into those decorators. It's it, you're quote unquote decorating the class with some functionality and doing that as opposed to like, to use Jack's example of authorize, it's to avoid like an if authorized check in, in the function. Instead you decorate it and then whatever is consuming that class can look for the, 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 whether that decorator is there to provide some functionality, but it's nice for simple examples like that, but in my experience, using them at scale, like people tend to get out of hand with these things. Like Java can get, <laughs> I've seen classes have, with a, a large collection 15. of decorators <laughs> <laughs> and it can kind of make your, your logic a little bit indirect. Um, that's getting at like the AOP thing yeah. too, where it's like an if check is sometimes messy, but it's also very clear what it's doing. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious to see how the what the JavaScript world's take on this is though because we do have we're starting to get more and more features from the sort of Java ish sort of and I don't think it's ruined the language yet because we can safely ignore them if they're not <laughs> actually providing value. You know what's crazy? I actually use this on a daily basis and I totally forgot about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I use I use type, type GraphQL, which is really great and it's a nice. Uh, kind of mid layer and it, it you know, makes your JavaScript object, turns them into TypeScript or, or GraphQL. It kind of annotates them with the GraphQL stuff, right? So that they're compatible. And then you just, you know, you can, it's just really easy. And it, it seemed so seamless that I just kind of forget about it. And then that's where, where it should be. But mm -hmm. yeah. So is this improvement more of something that library authors are going to care about? Or is this something that you as a JavaScript developer would act or a TypeScript developer would actually use? Because I've 
like you say, I've used decorators, but I don't think I've ever written one. So no. is that something that just comes with the library and you then can just annotate whatever at the top of a function or a class? 99% I, of the time. Yeah, I think so. Cause I, I'm thinking back to you Paige, cause I remember doing spring stuff in Java and those were the decorators <laughs> that actually were somewhat useful. And that was again, a library. Like I wasn't writing these myself. It's just like, yeah little ways I can annotate functions and get some magic behavior. So if you're, if you're a library out there, if you have like an authorization library or um, something like that, I could see, I could see how this could be kind of nice. You could build a pretty slick API with this. Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's some other stuff in here. I, I don't know. Like I always feel like uh, they list like 12 different changes. Um, we can link to this one as well. If you want to look through them. Uh, but yeah, decorators it's pretty inside baseball. Decorators. I don't know. Is it really worth a major version upgrade? They, they support it. They've been supporting decorators forever. Like, really? yeah, I don't know. They, they do have a whole section in here about upgrade pass. Cause it's different than their experimental version uh, of decorators. So okay. I imagine the angular people out there are going to have a fun time. Well, um, yeah. It's a question of whether it's different other. for the user or whether it's different for the library author. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Hopefully it's just different for the library author and I don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Well, the TypeScript, That's... I will say the TypeScript team has been quite good about upgrading because I have not had many issues just bumping up versions. Like, in fact, <laughs> I can't think of a single time where I bumped up a version number and something like unexpected broke or happened. It's been pretty no. seamless when I've had to do this in the past. So yeah. Good job. Good on them for team. that at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good going guys. Keep it up. All right. Next new version. Svelte kit 1.0 back Yay. into December. <laughs> so, Svelte is a recurring topic on the show. We might know that we're, <laughs> we're, we're somewhat fans of, of Svelte and Svelte kit is, is basically their, their project that adds some, like, I always think of it as like the next JS yeah. uh, mm -hmm. of for, exactly. for Spelt. So it adds like server side rendering, a bunch of other stuff as well. Page mm -hmm. and file based page routing kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it been out for a while, but it reached 1.0. So that's kind of exciting. Um, I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on this or if you've tried it out yet at all. I have not tried it out yet. I've read through the documentation. Um, it seems like the features are really exciting, but the thing that I think is most interesting or most exciting to me is that by reaching 1.0, Svelte has kind of started to establish itself as something that could be used in production for companies or enterprise mm. organizations. You know, it's, it's really starting to add in all of the things that people typically tend to want when they have an application that's going to scale or something that really needs to have consistent uptime or is well supported. Um, and I think that this is a really good indicator that they're in the game and that they're going to stay around for a while. So, you know, I have, like I said, I haven't had a big chance to try out all the new features yet. I'm really excited to, I just need to find some time and actually do it. Um, but I think it's a really good mark in their favor and a mark that people, you know, larger groups of folks are taking them seriously and that they're thinking about the larger community and not just the niche Svelte users who have used and loved the framework for a long time. It's definitely gotten much more popular, uh, you know, with uh, definitely with the advent of Svelte kit because that's the missing ingredient of that you know you need that a view framework is one thing but you need the routing you need all that um and i i, I sent a, somebody a graph recently of like how svelte kit was comparing to next.js and the next.js the velocity is better okay whatever but of all of the alternative frameworks svelte kit is definitely doing the best of all of them and i played around i, I kind of played around with the weird parts of it i love to do that it's like oh i kind of get routing <laughs> oh, yeah, i'm gonna dig into all the weirder shit I was, sorry. <laughs> and um, the one that I found was that the, like this form enhanced thing. And the idea was you'd have a, a regular HTML form, you know, kind of method post, I think, or whatever. And you know, the fields and all that. And like you may imagine like a search box or something. You have it wrapped in a form and then you got inside of the table. And literally all you have to do is 
add on like use colon enhance and it would automatically like you hit return on it and it would go and go off to the server make the fetch get, get the request back and then update it in place and it's just like boom you don't have to do any react query you don't have to do any of that and if the person has javascript off it just works because the browser just works well mm -hmm. with that and i like that i like the whole i like that that remix and uh svelte and solid uh solid start and astro are kind of going back to you know some of the stuff with the basic web stuff was okay you know it works why 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 are we you know why why all this rigmarole of doing like batch and everything you know you need all that right make mm -hmm. it easy yeah, I think I, I like pages framing too, that I think this is a sign that it's starting to get more of a serious option because I mean, we've had, we had to make a decision page at our work on what framework to use for like right up the sweet spot of this. And we went with Next.js, mm -hmm. but that was several months ago. Like if we were doing that today, we'd probably at least check this out, right? Evaluate sure. it, see if it was a good fit. And so mm -hmm. I think as it starts to work its way into that sort of decision-making process. Maybe it'll take off and start to give Next.js a run for its money. I guess we'll see. Yeah. And that reminds me, one of the nice things or one of the things that I really liked about SvelteKit when I was reading through all of its stuff is that it, it makes data fetching simpler. Mm. It takes away, is this a server rendered component? Is this a client rendered component? You just basically tell it, I need you to go get this data and it takes care of the rest. It doesn't, you don't have to specify what type of a component this is. It just, it just does it. Oh, interesting. And that's so refreshing that I don't have to care. It just does it I for remember, me. I remember Paige going down a rabbit hole with this. <laughs> it's like the client versus server can be, it's powerful in Next, but it can also be frustrating when you yeah. start to do that at scale. So, Particularly when you're using the same language in both, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it's like, wait a second, hold on, which, which, where am I running right now? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you, you lose track of like, wait, crap, where, like, what is this going to be running on? Do I have to care? Like, right. does it serialize? Uh, does it not? Oh my God, all the things. <laughs> just, just make it work. Exactly. All right, so I've, I've got another framework for you all because yet another new version. We have Astro 2.0 oh, yes. from mm -hmm. late mm -hmm. January. <laughs> and Jack, I'm going to, I know because when I searched for this, when I was researching it, Ooh. right on the front results was your video that nice. walked me through building an app with some thumbnails and stuff. So I'm going to let you take this one away. Uh, why is Astro 2.0 cool? Astro 2.0 is cool because Astro 1.0 was really cool and they've ex just extended <laughs> it, made it even better. And what they've done is they've created this uh, content collection API. So it's basically rolling a file-based CMS into the framework, right? So you can have a bunch of MDX files, which are amazing, super powerful markdown, but with the X means that you can embed components and do, it's just awesome. And so imagine like if you've got uh, a blog, you know, you could literally very quickly just, all I'm doing, you know, just add another file to add another entry. And then you could have other pages that would look at your blog entries and format them, make indices, you know, do all of that stuff for you. I think they actually have a blog starter right off the bat. Um, and yeah, if you if you are okay with the file based CMS system, which I think is actually good, right? So the idea is fairly simple. It's like if you set this up properly, you could have a GitHub repo with GitHub Actions that would go and deploy this Astro Two site, and literally you could be in GitHub, you could create a new PR with a new page in it, you know, literally just typing out, you know, the content like in in the browser, hit commit it would fire up these GitHub actions and deploy it, boom. And you've got a CMS system right there. You know, I, I, that was one of the responses was like, why wouldn't I use a CMS, you know, one of these 8,000 CMS vendors? And it's like, well, why would you? Mm -hmm. When when a file basis, I think people get into a mode where they're like, well, you need a CMS system. It's like, mm, do you really? Let's talk about that. Well, there's always a big sliding scale for that sort of thing, because sometimes you need a traditional CMS, those, they have their places, but almost mm -hmm. always 
you need some ability to add a bunch of custom stuff on top of it or around it. I mean, unless, I mean, for some people, the right fit is just a CMS that you use, put some generic theme and put out there and it's fine. But I feel like for most corporations, you're going to have that branded, it branded, customized. You're going to have some of your own behavior around it. Maybe like you've got like a, some content out, but then you need some widgets that need to go mm -hmm. in it that have mm -hmm. some custom ways of working and finding the mesh between those two is, is always hard. Cause if you go pure CMS, it always feels like you're just hacking in the richer functionality. It's like, oh crap, how do I make this work in this WordPress site? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and make it so this editor still works or on the flip side, if you go full, just like, oh, I'm going to build this with next JS or just raw react and the CMS always feels a little bit icky because then it's like, oh, I'm like bolting on this CMS and air quotes to make it work. So I feel like to me, at least this is where it's sweet spot is, is when you need like a customizable C CMS, I guess. Yeah. In a way. Well, uh, let me, let me, let me throw one out for a uh, page here. So like Home Depot, right? Mm -hmm. If you are, you're, you're building a page on like how to refill your tires or whatever. Right. And, but you want in there like a tire finder because maybe your tires are, are bald and you need new tires. So you want like right. a tire finder in there. Mm -hmm. You could make a tire finder component and then just it, reference it inside that MDX file. And now you've yeah. got all the cool content and you've got the page, the image and all the blah, 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 blah. And then you've got this tire finder, which is a completely interactive, like widgety thing that, that also upsells to getting you new tires right there right so this is exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying like it's it, it's that beautiful like that's ah, great i don't know it's such great <laughs> try it out it's really good you'll love it and it's fast oh my gosh it's so fast like if you if you don't have a page that has any javascript that's required on the client guess how much javascript goes to the client zero zero, <laughs> zero. none nada yeah and that's where it should be like i mean uh, everybody's going on about like Next.js 13 and React Server components. Guess what? You you boot up the, like the Next.js RSC React Server component demo page, and it's got you know how much the code it sends seventy one k or seventy four k of bundle to the client. For what? There's no there's nothing happening on the client. Why are you sending this much JavaScript? Ah! Yeah. Unless you need it, right? Like so, if you're building something more of like a really rich application, right? Then Astro probably isn't the best. I mean, you could definitely do it with Astro, but I yeah. feel like Next is a better fit for like, I have a bunch of stuff going on. Like this is a reasonably JavaScript heavy site. Then mm -hmm. you need the stuff that that 70K of JavaScript is doing. You're using it in some fashion. Sure, but that but Next in the Next.js 12 does a really good job of that. That's a highly interactive, highly dynamic sites, all that stuff, right? But Next.js 13 is supposedly getting us into this world of like also being really good for static stuff. And yet, even when it's all because of the React server components, and even when it is all static, you're still getting the JavaScript out of the page. Well, I don't think they can totally divorce themselves of all of that, right? They're, they, you try to optimize it, but it's it's still a big, heavy monster <laughs> to try to throw right. it at the problem. Exactly. Okay, make some divorce joke, you know, like take the keys, <laughs> take the car, <laughs> take the kids. <laughs> All right, so one, I'm going down the list of, I think, every, every the who's who of React frameworks. So <laughs> next on our list is Gatsby. And mm -hmm. the news with Gatsby is that Netlify has acquired Gatsby. And to read the headline, Netlify acquires Gatsby Inc. to accelerate adoption of composable web architectures. Mm. So I, I, I did not see this news coming. I, I don't know. I, I'm, Gatsby has kind of been somewhat on the decline. I feel like just it, it not like dropped off drastically or anything, but it's certainly not the the latest and greatest. Yeah, I don't see a lot of people saying is, like, "Let's do Gatsby." Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that everybody is flocking to. Uh, these are private companies, so we don't have a great sense of like the actual business. Was was Gatsby making money? Were they in trouble? I don't think anybody. I don't think we're ever going to publicly know that, but it it is interesting to see more of this, like the like the VC, the business sidey coming, uh, further becoming a part of our our lives in the the front end in the React world. Yeah, I mean, we I think that when we did our um, 2023 predictions, we predicted that there would continue to be acquisitions of various <laughs> uh, frameworks. See. 
Yeah. <laughs> Acquisition Palooza. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think that any of us ever said Gatsby when we were thinking it, but it it kind of makes sense. You know, Vercel has Next.js, uh, Shopify has Remix. Um, it, it just, it kind of starts to make sense. If you're going to have a dog in the React fight, you better buy your framework so that you can say it integrates the best with our platform and therefore you should use it if you want to use our platform. And I'm a Netlify user. I'll, I'm also a Vercel user. I'm not a Shopify user. I don't have an online shop, but it's nice to know that if you if you really want to be on a specific platform or if you really want to use a specific framework, you have at least one platform that you know is going to integrate as seamlessly as possible. So I can see why they would go with Gatsby and Gatsby also has Gatsby Cloud, which was their enterprise version. So I'm sure Netlify is going to be taking some of that technology and rolling it into their own offerings. So, you know, I can definitely see some potential benefits for it. It'll, it just remains to be seen how much they will try and push the Gatsby framework forward or how much they will just try and integrate some of its bigger enterprise offerings to make themselves more attractive to larger, larger scale companies. Yeah. Netlify has always been, I love using Netlify. They're kind of my go-to for hosting. But my mm -hmm. concern with Netlify has always been I pay Netlify like basically zero money, which is, <laughs> which is, I mean, which is cool, That's real good. right? Like, I mean, right. I, I'm getting a lot of value out of it, but also like, I like the tools that I use to continue to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think like I read this as them trying to get in the doors of some of these Gatsby has a little bit more of an enterprise focus than just. Netlify's traditional business, which I feel is very just like open source, uh, individual developers sort of thing. So I think I read this as them trying to get more into some more enterprise conversations, having some more enterprise tools at their disposal. And I guess best of luck to them because I, I like what they're doing and hopefully, hopefully this ends up working out for them. And Gatsby has yeah. a good story around this, right? I mean, their whole thing was like, you'd have these plugins that would then add additional material into this GraphQL schema for CMS. And then you would render your pages based on the GraphQL. So, you know, you could swap out Prisma for whatever, you know, on the fly. And that, yeah, that's, you know, if you got that open source story, I think that's really a good match. I mean, but how, what, what are the pickings out there, right? If, if you've got Remix, if me, Next.js and Remix are always spoken for, mm -hmm. you know, there's Gatsby, there's Redwood JS. I don't know, you know, okay, there's that. There's Astro. You can grab Astro. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there was a bunch of like, you know, other ones, but those are like the big, big ones. I think Astro has got more mind share than it actually has deployed sites currently. <laughs> so that is the end of our, our framework arc in terms of, <laughs> in terms of updates. Uh, it's, it's been a while, but it's been, uh, it's also really cool, right? Like yeah. uh, we, you, this is what you want. It, you want these, the, the, the competition, the frameworks evolving all the time. Cause at the end of the day, it just means better stuff for us to use. So mm -hmm. it's very cool. There's a lot of choices. Uh, and I, yeah. And, you know, everybody wants to know, like, what the number, like, what, which is the best? And it's like, no, uh, that's, it that's a hard thing to say. Exactly. It depends. <laughs> yeah. It should, should be a motto of our podcast. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, right. Uh, it depends. I, and I think, too, that, like, that's, to me, that's a sign of a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. And you, you want to be in that scenario. And... We've had episodes before where we've talked about how to cope with that and how to deal with that and how to approach it in your day-to-day -day work. Because I've been doing front end now for 15-ish years. And I remember the days if it was like, well, but backbones out and uh, the, you know, those, those conversations. And it's like, oh, Moo tools or jQuery. And then it was mm -hmm. Angular JS or or the initial React. And like these conversations keep happening, but that's just a good thing. And part of your job as a front end developer is just learning to be comfortable in that sort of ecosystem, how to keep on top of things, how to keep from being overwhelmed. So yeah. I've heard it described recently as we're living in a golden age of JavaScript. And when you think about the amount of 
like you said, options and the new things that are coming online all the time, the new features, the new additions, the new, just everything. I, I could see that being a real accurate statement when I think about it. It's a great time to be a JavaScript developer. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, so the last topic I have on my list, this is a Jack special, uh, because Jack <laughs> Jack was wrong about nested React components, and Jack also didn't realize that apparently this is a very controversial topic. So Jack, I'm going to let you take it away and just describe uh, your, your video and then sort of the reaction to it and the fallout from there. Sure, the video title is Classic Clickbait. Basically, a couple of weeks earlier, I put out a video that talked about some different anti-patterns that I was seeing in React. And one of them was where people, I don't know if you've seen this, but where like, as an example, you might have like an app component and so you got a function app and then, you know, kind of within that, you know, so this is going to be the, the container for your app, the frame, right? So it's got a header, it's got a footer, it's got that sort of stuff. And I've seen people go and define the header and the footer as functions within app. Right. They do literally instead of like importing them from somewhere else or defining them some, at the top level in the same file, they literally Im put them in the same component. And in, during when the component renders, it defines a new header every time. And that, I think that's what people miss is that they think that like because the implementation is the same, the function is the same. And so I was like, in that video, I was like, ah, this is probably not a great idea, but I, I don't do it. But if you want to do it, it's okay. And then like I did the actual numbers, I actually ran some tests on it. And it was like, oh, no, this is not good. This is like your, your, your component is going to re-render every single time. And if you define any state in any of those nested components that you defined as nested components, like I want to separate this from React nesting of components like children and stuff. That's not that. This is like the definition of the component is nested. If you define any state in there, that, that state's going to get reset every time. And the, the, the host app component re-renders, which is probably not what you expect. Anyway, so I, I created a much smaller video on like, hey, just don't do this, you know, kind of thing. And <laughs> a lot of folks were like, I don't do this anyway. I don't know. You're, you're nuts. Like, I've never seen anybody do this. I'm like, okay, cool. And like, I have. Um, and then there were a bunch of folks that are like, oh, this, I do this all the time. What do you mean it's bad? <laughs> and, the, the, and then they come up with all these different ideas like, oh, you could use memo. You could use a use memo to, to fix this or use a use callback to fix this. And I'm like, but, but why? Why? Right. Like why yeah. you're, you're using a, a hook called use callback to make a new component. Does that not sound weird to you? Like use callback seems very specific to me to a specific type of thing, a callback, right? And here you are using to make a new component. What, what, you know, and why? And so the why is, and, and you know, you drill down with a couple of these folks, well, why are you doing this? And it's like, no, I want to just use, I don't want to pass props. I'm lazy. I don't like doing all the TypeScript definitions of all the props and everything, literally. And I'm like, I just want to be able to reuse the local stuff in that state, in that, in the parent component, the state and all that in my component. And I just don't want to, I don't want to deal with context. I don't want to deal with props. I just want it. And you're like, whoa, dude, that is like, you're breaking React as a paradigm because you just don't like props. I, I've totally been guilty of this though. Like, especially for, <laughs> si for simple things. Sure. Right? Okay. It's, it's like, why, why am I going to externalize that? I could just initialize it right here. It's got like three things like uh, subjectively in my head, it's cleaner to like mentally parse when it's all right there and I don't have to pass anything and it's, it's right there. Uh, but I can see you also kind of know, like I, I should probably abstract this. I should probably <laughs> like, you got the voice in the back of your head ah, yeah. telling you that like, I'm doing the quick and dirty thing. And if I'm doing it for like a little demo thing where the performance isn't going to make or break anything, then sure. But if this is something that's going to scale or is used in like an actually important app, I should probably take the work to, to make it external, bring it in, pass the props appropriately. Yeah. Refactor it, add the TypeScript types. <laughs> Don't be lazy. <laughs> Don't be lazy. And I think it's, it's as a, Senior engineer, we're always trying to like, I, I don't know about you guys, but like, worry, like they do the principle of least surprise. I don't like code this cute. I don't want it to yeah. do weird stuff. 
And in this case, if I were to go in and just randomly add a use state to the header to just track the cart count or whatever, and then that state were to just get vanished every time, I'd be like, what the heck is going on? And it's because yeah. you defined header inside of app. And the other thing is like these, these components just get monster. If you do that, if you create like an app component that's got like yeah, 15 yeah. components in it, jeez, yeah. it's huge, huge. I was going to say that's that's usually why I end up regretting it is because I start by saying like, oh, well, oh this very is small. simple, right? Like, yeah. it's just, right. it's it's just in line. I mean, what could happen? Then another feature <laughs> request comes in. It's like, oh, well, it's right it's here. It's a little like, more. Just tack it on. It's fine. Just tack it on. It's not going to hurt anybody. Suddenly you have state in every component all the way yeah. down the line. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you got like a 500 line component and you're like, ooh, when did yeah, that you happen? You refactor that. Yeah, it's probably not good. <laughs> uh, well th Those this has been days. a lot of fun um do we have any other news uh, anything else uh that we want to get out there otherwise we can well we'll have to do another one of these i think it's a good a good time to catch up on the, the latest and greatest happenings but anything else that we that i've missed that we haven't covered no i think, I think that's about it for now i'm sure there will be new stuff next week but i yeah. think we're up to date <laughs> JavaScript world doesn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. Cool. Well, with that, why don't we head into our picks, which we pick something from around our lives, music, movies, kitchen utensils quite often. And Jack, do you want to kick us off today? Yeah, sure. My pick is actually right at my hand. It's a, a Logitech vertical mouse. And it, it, a you vertical know, mouse. A vertical mouse, right? It's, a, it's like you hold it kind of up. You know, kind of, and you move it around, and it's whoa. it's so, whoa, and it's supposedly more ergonomic. <laughs> and I think I was moving my daughter from, you know, apartment to moving whatever. I am in the U-Haul, and the guy's got a vertical mouse. I'm like, hey, is that any good? And he's like, yeah, actually, it's really good. <laughs> and I I tried it out, and it he's right, it's great. I don't get any wrist pain. I don't get anything. It feels good. Works great. The only problem is like every once in a while, I just kind of chuck it. Like randomly, like my hand just sort of hits it because it's it's taller than the older mouse, and no, it just sort of tumbles, yeah, can... flies, and then the battery <laughs> case just pops out, and like batteries over you know, whatever. It's a mess. But other than that, it's great. I'll, I might have to check that out because I have had wrist pain in the past, and like when my my mouse wrist starts to hurt, I'll just switch hands and just switch use the mouse in the other hand for a bit. But that's not the greatest solution, so. And all this I'm ergo stuff, there's always that time, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to have to invest a week just to get it, make it feel comfortable and blah, 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 blah. This was comfortable in seconds. It was like, nice. it was, it was an improvement that I, it was just done. It's just interesting because I've never seen one before. That's oh. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Cool. Uh, Paige, what picks do you have for us? Uh, my pick today is going to be a new series. Well, it's not a new new series, but it's one that's new to me. Um, and it's called, I think we may have talked about it before, actually. It's called Only Murders in the Building. Mm -hmm. And it's got yeah. um, Martin Sheen and Steve Martin and Selena Gomez. And the, I just started watching it a couple nights ago, but there's cameos by people like Nathan Lane and Tina Fey. And it's it's awesome sting um so oh wow oh right yeah. yes i remember yeah. that. that was hilarious there's there's big names um the plot so far has been really good there's a lot of references to pop culture like there's this podcast a true crime podcast in the actual show that is very similar to serial um so it's funny to see kind of them making a little bit of fun of that and and playing off of it so it's if you're looking for kind of a mystery whodunit with a lot of humor in it, uh, I would say that this is definitely one. I think there's two or three seasons at this point. So I think it's just it's two. Watching. I mean, I just haven't watched the second one yet. But <laughs> the the second season is also pretty good, and it cool. leaves on a cl a cl cliffhanger. So they're they're definitely planning on coming back. So yeah, that nice. was a good one. We watched it as well. <laughs> cool. Uh, my pick this week is a is a classic. I'm going to pick The Sixth Sense. So oh. uh, 
we, we ended up rewatching this to show it to our kids and it holds up amazingly. It's one of those movies where if you know, you know, so, it's, <laughs> um, but if you haven't watched it in a while, or if you've never seen it before, absolutely go check it out. And even if you haven't watched it, uh, in a while, like I hadn't, it's, it's definitely worth the second watch. It was a lot of fun. Are you an M night Shyamalan fan? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I, I've there's some of his other movies like I thought Signs was pretty good, mm-hmm. um, but then he kind of like his movies kind of tapered off for a while. Um, <laughs> I have not seen the the latest one because there's one that just hit. The yeah, year. the cabin in the this. what is it? It's cat knock, knock at the, at the cabin. door. I, not to be confused with Cabin in the Woods, which is a hilarious movie. Knock at the <laughs> okay. cabin is the yeah, is a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it. I don't know if either of you have. Uh, I thought the reviews were kind of like, eh, which is pretty standard for M. Night Shyamalan pretty, lately. Pretty, yeah, pretty standard yeah. for him lately. I think I but. saw some like The Onion article or something like that, where it was like M. Night, M. Night Shyamalan could be the first director whose movies are on a path to minus zero, negative Rotten Tomatoes score. Because like, it had this like <laughs> linear oh, yeah. progression of like just boom, oh, boom, yeah. boom. But yeah, Sixth Sense is a great one. But I, I think I saw one where it was like they're on a beach and they're aging like really fast yeah. on the beach. That old. was old. Yeah. yeah. That was not great. <laughs> yeah, it's been a slow progression downwards. I, there was, I, I've, seen, I've seen most of them, actually. Lady in the Water was really oh. bad. There was one with an elevator <laughs> that was not that great that I saw. So... <laughs> People keep giving him money to make these things, though. Right? So it's like how that's that how happen? desperate we are. And how I've man? seen a lot of them, so I'm I'm part of the problem. I think it's <laughs> you're just clinging on to like maybe maybe he can find it again. Yeah. We keep complaining about like oh this is MCU film eighty five thousand and it's the same thing over and over and over again. And then we're like and then you got this guy who's doing different content, right? Mm-hmm. And and then we're like uh, but uh, he's terrible, like. I don't. I don't think we're easy to please. That's what I'm. No. I think it's us. No, no. I think it's us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why we're doing reboots of everything. We can't come up with new good original ideas, so we're just going to remake old popular movies now. Roadhouse, right. Dirty Dancing. Oh, they're re- are, are they redoing Roadhouse? No way. They are. Oh mm-hmm. my! Why? And they're, they're redoing Columbo with Poker Face, and it's. <laughs> okay. There's a new Indiana Jones movie coming out. That's I just saw true. the preview for that, which I don't even know how how that's going to happen, but AI. Apparently it is. Movie magic, exactly. Movie, a lot of <laughs> yeah. a lot of de-aging and movie magic. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Apparently this one they really 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 get it right this time. Believe us. <laughs> it doesn't look like Gollum, but even Gollum was actually <laughs> better than some of the other ones. Mhm. All right. Well, this was a lot of fun, as always. Absolutely. It was always great catching up with all of you. Yeah. Getting up on the latest and greatest React news. <laughs> and yeah. So until next week, thanks, everybody. See you next yeah. time. See you then.